Welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Today, I will review the Mingda Magician X, a mid-range 3D printer. The price today as this video is recorded is $299. Compared to an entry-level 3D printer, which costs $200, I will look into the hardware and the details and see what we can get for that extra $100. 1. A dual Z-axis with a timing belt. Instead of a single stepper motor and a lead screw to control the Z-axis, I consider a dual Z-axis to be quite important if you want to improve the print quality, for this can make sure the gantry is level. Normally, a dual Z upgrade kit without a timing belt would cost around $40, so I will add $45 to this upgrade. 2. A direct drive extruder. Instead of a single gear Bowden tube setup, it came with a dual gear direct drive extruder. It not only improves film and retraction, a shorter retraction distance during the print also uses less time. A direct drive extruder kit would cost around $40, plus the dual gear, so I will add another $45. 3. Auto Bed Leveling This printer came with a strain gauge, which is commonly used by a few new generation printers like the CR6SE and CR10 Smart. A BL Touch would cost around $40, and other cheaper sensors would cost around $15 to $20. I will add another $20 for this bed leveling feature. 4. Silent Stepper Drivers This printer came with TMC2209 silent drivers on the X, Y, and Z axes. The cost would be around $20. 5. Belt tensioners on both the X and Y axis. A set of belt tensioners would cost around $25, so I'll add another $25. 6. A color touch screen. The price difference between the color touch screen and a classic 12864 LCD screen is around $20, so I will add another $20. 7. A faster 32-bit board. Entry-level 3D printers use a Cortex-M3 processor, which is 72 MHz. This board came with a Cortex-M4 processor, which is 168 MHz. It won't have any impact on the print quality, but it would be nicer to have a faster chip, so I would pay a few more dollars for that. I will just add $5. 8. A filament sensor. A filament sensor only costs a few dollars, but it could save you money when you are printing large models. You definitely don't want to reprint it again if you run out of filament in the middle of the print, so I'll add another $5. 9. Besides all these hardware upgrades, there are some other small details, like higher quality limit switches, a drawer, better quality cable management, limit switch covers, extra SD card holders, and USB drive support. Since all these features are difficult to put a price on, I think I'd be happy with paying an extra $20 for all these minor upgrades. All these upgrades cost around $205, so if we buy a $200 basic 3D printer and add all these upgrades, it would cost around $405. If this printer is only $299, I would say it is worth the price, at least on paper. So let's open up the box and see what's inside. As you can see, this printer is pretty much assembled. You just need to connect the gantry to the base, install the filament holder and the drawer cover, and then connect some cables. I will go through the assembly process really quickly. First, connect the gantry to the base and align the extrusion to the slot. To assemble the whole printer, you only need these six screws. Fix it with two shorter screws, tighten it, and do the same to the other side. Flip it over, tighten the longer screw at the bottom, and do the same to both sides. To install the filament holder, you don't need any screws, just snap it on top of the printer. Put on the drawer cover, and we can now connect some cables. Let's start with the extruder assembly. This single ribbon cable will connect the hot end, thermistor, bed leveling sensor, and all the fans inside. Then, it runs through another ribbon cable to connect everything to the motherboard. The red connector is for the x limit switch, and the white connector is for the x stepper motor. Next, we will take care of the back of the printer. Connect the heat bed bed cable, tighten the z-axis stepper motor screws, and connect the stepper motor cable. 
as this is a dual Z axis, we will do the same to the other side. I will do a final check on the belt tensioners to make sure they are not loose and not overly tight. Also, check the rubber wheels on the X and Z axis. No wheel should be able to spin alone. If so, turn the eccentric nut to adjust the distance between the wheel and the T-slot. Finally, we can connect the power and turn on the printer. The assembly is now done. It should take less than 10 minutes. Before I start any test print, I will open the cover of the hot end assembly to see what's inside and see how the sped leveling system works. We have a pancake stepper motor, which is lighter than a normal NEMA 17 stepper motor. The hot end and the nozzle are in E3D style, and the extruder is direct extruder. You won't see a BL Touch type leveling sensor as it's using a strain gauge. When the nozzle is touching the bed, it applies pressure, so the strain gauge on the top will sense it. Tell the firmware that the nozzle is at the lowest point. Okay, let's try the auto bed leveling feature. When I press the leveling button, it heats up the nozzle to 150 degrees, so any filament left on the nozzle will melt and won't affect the strain gauge leveling system. The bed also needs to heat up as we want to level the bed at our normal printing temperature, as the glass bed is going to expand a little when heated. When the temperatures are reached, it starts to home the printer, followed by a 16-point probe. Let's switch to the side and see how it works. When the nozzle is touching the bed, the strain gauge senses the pressure, so the red light is on. You just need to level it once and re-level it only after you change something like the nozzle, or remove the bed for cleaning. After all 16 points are probed, I will install the sample filament and test it out to make sure everything is working. Select Preheat PLA, and once the preset temperatures are reached, go to Menu, Extrude, and I will set the speed to Fast and the distance to 10 millimeters. Press it a few times and extrude some filament. Then, I will start with the sample G-code file that came with the printer. Let's try this face. The G-code file was sliced with a raft, which I normally won't use, but let's just let it finish and see how it works. This round circle can tell if our X and Y belt tension is just right. If not, the circle won't look like this. The layers are looking nice and the extruder is also working fine. This face or bottle looks good. As the G-code is sliced using base mode, there is no retraction at all and the layers are looking really nice. The sample filament is just enough to print this model. I will now use my own filament to do some more test prints. First, I will start with the calibration cube. As you can see, it didn't stick very well and the corners were warped. The first layer is too thick and it didn't squeeze the filament close enough to the bed. I need to adjust the Z offset and make the nozzle print closer to the bed on the first layer. Besides that, the X, Y, Z and the flat surfaces are all looking good. Go to the menu and go to Z offset. The current value is 0.65 millimeters. I will move it 0.15 closer to the bed, so I will set it to 0.5. Save the value to the firmware and we will now try more prints. Let's try a 3D Benchy. It seems 0.5 millimeters is right on the spot. There is no more warping. Let it finish and we will see the result. This is one of the best benchies I have ever printed using out-of-the-box settings. It looks really good. There is no stringing, no warping, and the cooling and overhanging are all good. The one on the left was printed by the Prusa MK3S Plus, and it's difficult to tell them apart. Next, I will try a simple stringing test. Normally, a Bowden setup requires more tuning to print this model, but I think it should work much better with a direct drive extruder. As you can see, there's no stringing between the two poles, so I will try to print something tougher. If you've watched my previous videos, you may know that I have printed this Eiffel Tower on many printers. Most of them can't get very good results, so this is a good test on this dual gear direct drive extruder. It seems okay so far. It's much cleaner than a Bowden setup. Let it finish, and we will compare it to the same print from the Prusa MK3S Plus and the Ender 5 Pro. It's not perfect, but I would say it's better than most other printers I've ever tested. 
The one on the left is printed by Prusa MK3S Plus, the middle one is from Magician X, and the one on the right is from an Ender 5 Pro. The gray one from Prusa is using Prusa PLA filament, and the black one is also using Prusa black PLA filament. The one from the Ender 5 is using Creality PLA filament. Next, I will print something to test the bed leveling sensor. I will use the whole print bed to print 20 of these small disks. This model only has three layers, so if the bed is level, we should be able to print all of them without any issues. We need to make sure those prints on the center of the bed look the same as those at the corners or edges. Okay, here is the result. Let's flip it over and see the bottom layer. I would say this strain gauge bed leveling sensor is working great. If you have to print something like this, I would suggest to re-level the bed before printing to get the best result. Finally, I will print some flexible filament. I have designed a card wallet and it would be perfect for this test. I won't slow it down, I will just print at a normal speed. The only change I made is to increase the printing temperature to 220 degrees and the print bed to 80 degrees. There is a tiny bit of stringing at the top, but the print is still quite nice. I can fit 4-5 to five cards in this card wallet. This flexible TPU filament is really nice, and I also put the link below. Okay, let's talk about what I like about this printer. First, it's super easy to assemble, and it prints really nice out of the box. From the Eiffel Tower test print, the filament retraction is outstanding. The direct drive and the dual gear extruder work very well. From the 20 disc test print, the dual Z axis with the timing belt and strain gauge bed leveling sensors are all doing their job, so we have a perfect first layer on the whole print surface. Second, it has a super sturdy print bed. There are no leveling springs underneath to adjust the corners. Third, the wider X axis aluminum extrusion provides better support to the X carriage and hot end assembly. This wider extrusion also enables these two ribbon cables to connect the hot end and extend to the motherboard, so it works like a cable chain. This is really smart cable management. Fourth, surprisingly, this printer uses a lot of injection mold parts. Generally, manufacturers try to avoid using injection molding and use existing off-the-shelf parts or 3D printer parts, as the cost of an injection mold is quite expensive. But this manufacturer uses injection molds everywhere. I guess they may have a strong background in the injection molding industry, but as long as it doesn't reflect on the price of the printer, I like to see parts made from injection molds. Fifth, this printer supports full SD card and USB drive, which is much better than a micro SD card. Finally, there are also quite a lot of small detail upgrades like higher quality limit switches with covers, a more durable heated bed cable, drawers, and SD card holders. The SD card that came with this printer is made in Japan as well, which I didn't expect. But no DIY 3D printer is perfect, so let's talk about what I think this printer can improve on. First, for the packaging, using styrofoam is very inconvenient, and using laser cut foam instead may be better. After a long way of shipping, when I opened the box, tiny pieces of styrofoam were everywhere, on the surface and in T-slots and connectors. If there's a vacuum nearby, it's not too big of a deal, but if not, it is quite annoying. Second, the extruder lever. It was fine and the length was okay without the cover, but with this cover, the space between the lever and the cover is tight. It's not that easy to pull it when you need to change the filament. Third, the glass bed that came with this printer is alright, but personally, I would like to see a PEI spring steel sheet instead, so you don't have to wait for the bed to cool down to remove the print. This can also make the printer look more premium. Fourth, the silicon sock for the heater block doesn't have a cutout for the wires. If I need to put this on, I need to cut it manually. This may be a bit frustrating for someone who is new to 3D printing. Finally, the manufacturer should contact Ultimaker to add their profile to Cura. For users with some experience, adding a new printer profile manually is not that big of a deal, as the profile of all printers with an Arduino mainboard and Marlin-based firmware are most likely the same. Even using another similar printer and changing a few numbers in the profile could also work. However, having your brand and model in the Cura printer list would definitely improve user experience and be good for the brand. But 
All of these are very minor issues. They don't affect the print quality and the overall performance. In conclusion, this printer is really nice and absolutely worth the price. If you want something more than just an entry-level 3D printer, and you have a budget of around $300, you can consider this Mingda Magician X. I would like to see more mid-range 3D printers like this in the market. Instead of trying to find the cheapest printer in the world, I would rather pay a little bit more for a higher quality printer with more features. That's it for this video. If you like this video, please hit the like and subscribe button. My brother and I make a new video every weekend, so check out my channel on Mondays and you'll see something new. See you next week.